Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Apogee, Brian Kirshner. Thanks for being here. I am so glad that that last phenomenal discussion ended on the note that it's all about people. So in addition to speaking in this session, I've been the lead in coordinating all the sessions in this room today, all the speakers you'll hear from. And the underlying theme for what topics we cover and who we invited from our phenomenal customers and partners was that making real what Chet discussed in his keynote is all about people. And despite the fact that nine out of 10 of my Apigee colleagues would call me a data guy, exceeded only in comparison by the 10 out of 10 who would say he's the old guy with the long gray hair, my experience at Apigee has been about talking to people and learning from them and understanding how we bring data to bear. So we have a corporate board member here who I met because she wanted to learn more about APIs. We have people running lines of business here to talk about their experience changing culture. We have technologists talking about best practices using APIs. What we hope you take away from your whole experience today are ways that you and your colleagues and your peers and your bosses and the people who work for you can take action on the journey to adapt rather than die. I should also add, this was not by design, but I think it works really well when we talk about meshing the gears of digital leverage or being ground between them. It strikes me these guys in the hard hats are actually working on the problem. How do we mesh the gears? This woman who looks like she's in scrubs is probably checking the medical status of someone who got caught in the gears. And these young women are probably like looking at the Reddit feed of the terrible story of the boy who was ground in the gears. So before I get started, um, we do have things set up so that you can text questions at any time during the session. If you have a question, text this code at QQQ to 35134. I've got an iPad up here so we can have questions queued up given that we've got 30 minutes together. You'll have 140 characters. Um, if you're willing to do that, we'll still take questions from the floor. If you're willing to do that, it will help us capture every question and bring it back to the online Apogee community, which we really want to do. My only ask is please make sure your volume is off, because if it's not, you're going to get an SMS to respond to. And so every time I say something confusing or controversial, half the phones in the room are going to ring if you do. So why did we change the title of the conference? My role at Apogee has been about what's next for our customers, a forward look and how we translate what we think is coming into advice people can use today. It's really been inspired by this quote from William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And so in 2013, we thought the future was here in terms of the value of APIs. And so we started out a conference series to evangelize why you should love APIs. 2016, we're talking about adapt or die. Why did we change? Well, something happened along the way. The future of APIs became very widely distributed. So in 2015, you could read about the strategic value of APIs in business in the Harvard Business Review. Early in 2016, some of the big analyst firms caught up and Forrester started talking about APIs as a platform. Gartner started talking about the API economy. And to really cap things off, you could read what APIs are in The Economist by May of this year. So our mission is to help our customers, our partners, figure out what's coming next that's not quite obvious. APIs are obvious. They're everywhere, they're valuable, you can read about them in some of the most venerable business and technology magazines that there are. So we wanna focus on what's next. What has happened now that APIs have become widely distributed? And our view is that they've unlocked what we call the economics of digital leverage. You can think about what I'm gonna share in the next 20 minutes or so as a double click on what Chet presented about the relationship between business model and architecture. How do you do it? What does it mean to different roles in the enterprise? What does it look like today in the small parts of industries where the next thing has become widely distributed? So just to level set, here's an API call. 
JavaScript API call embedded in the website. You may recognize what it is uh, if you have good eyes or you know, if, you're, if you're a real geek. Um, it's a nice, clean, simple, elegant way for a developer to tap a digital resource. In this case, this very short line of code gets you a nice Google map centered on Sydney, Australia. Simple concept, but now that everything's connected by a cloud, I propose that the way to think about APIs is think about them as a cargo container. So the shape of the global economy as we know it today, global trade as we know it today, didn't exist prior to the 1950s when someone came up with the concept of the cargo container as a standard way to move a valuable payload. It was a physical innovation. It literally was a container. But it was also a standard. And once there was a standard, you had two sides of the market, people making those valuable payloads and people figuring out how to move them in this standard form much more quickly, leading to the cost of transporting valuable payloads, whether that's raw materials or finished goods, changing it from as much as a third of the price of a finished product, which made global supply chains totally infeasible, to a footnote, to today's reality where moving things around globally is actually cheaper than doing it in your local market much of the time. And so if you think about APIs as this container, it's a way for a developer to exchange their own valuable payload, the code that's running in their app, Google to send a valuable payload, that map, and then for more valuable payload data to be captured from every interaction with that map. That's true for every modern connected web API, whether it's about making a purchase, posting something on Facebook, or calling a map. What APIs are doing is just like what the shipping container did. It changed the shape of the economy. It changed the fundamentals of doing business. We haven't written this book yet, the API, like the box, but this book is going to be written. So here's what's special about APIs versus cargo containers. The payload of an API is digital, whether it's data or whether it's code. And digital has a very special property. Digital signals can be perfectly replicated an infinite number of times at zero marginal cost. This was articulated wonderfully in Harvard Business Review article in November 2014. The two authors, Marco Iancidi and Kareem Lakhani, actually founded the digital program at Harvard Business School. So think about that. By 2014, MBAs are learning about APIs. Every one of sort of the elite new crop of MBA candidates, future business managers, are learning about APIs in school. And they're learning about how do we create value using this new resource that can be perfectly replicated an infinite number of times at zero marginal cost. Big difference from analog or physical products, right? When we, digital came into competition with analog signals, movies, music, digitized books, I think we all have a very clear idea of what happened. Netflix beats Blockbuster. Amazon beats Borders. If you asked me when I was a kid, I was always an audiophile. If I'd be streaming compressed MP3s rather than loading some sort of physical entity into some giant machine with huge speakers, I would have laughed. I would be like, I want the technology to make the sound better and better and better. But you know what? Convenience wins. And so digital transformed the world of analog business. What about physical business? Well, you can't get rid of the tractor there's still going to be a physical asset that does degrade with use, that can't be infinitely reproduced at no marginal cost. But here's where we are today. I didn't make this slide. I pulled this slide from the John Deere website. This is part of John Deere's suite of technology solutions. It's a platform business model where they are monitoring, operating, optimizing things like tractors. So sure. It costs money to build a tractor. Tractors degrade with use. But every moment of every day that they're monitoring that tractor, they're getting data that enables them to optimize it, 
to make your fleet work better, to predict when a failure is going to happen. This is the premise of the mixture of physical and digital, putting a digital layer on top of physical assets that enables creating more value, use creating value. So that's the first of these gears we want to talk about because these forces interlock. We've got the ability for use to create value, whether that's in a purely digital transaction or by putting a digital layer over the physical world. You combine that with tools so you can scale on demand. Chet talked about that this morning. Once you figure out that digital play on how to create value with use, cloud enables you to be ready to take advantage of success, and it also enables you to make small bets. You don't have to build your own data center and find out that the demand isn't there. You can test with on-demand resources and fail fast. And so finally, the third gear that meshes with that is the know-how for sustainable agility at pace, for delivering digital experiences, writing code in ways we couldn't do before. I'll talk about all three of these things and what the shape of the future looks like in companies right now. So opportunity. This is real today. This is the API playing field on the public internet. A think tank called the Center for Global Enterprise created this global visualization where each node is an API that's being widely called by other APIs, right? They're APIs with an ecosystem. So you'll see digital native businesses like Twilio, so they're monetizing SMS and other communications APIs. You'll see Google Maps as a giant hub. You'll see Amazon's product APIs. So it's the playing field, and it's also the scoreboard. They assessed the value of platform businesses who are tapping the ecosystem like that at $4.3 trillion this year, and it's growing. Right? Every company that aspires to be the Uber of X, and there's lots of them, winds up here. Uber's a prime example. Right? It's not a purely digital experience. Somebody needs to provide that car. The drivers need to provide the car. We need to provide our cell phones, our smartphones, which we do very conveniently at no cost to Uber. But by being the digital layer on top of that, every time we take a ride, they get smarter about predicting time to curb. They get better at predicting uh, pricing and what levels the market will clear with drivers and riders. Right? But it's not just for digital natives. These are all real right now. Walgreens talks about putting an API around their stores. Their photo prints APIs to print photos in their store has more than 100 third-party apps using that API. McCormick Spice Company, they, they make spices. They also have a big B2B business consulting about food because they know about food science. As their CEO at the time said to me, the chances of any one of us having not eaten food at a restaurant or from a supermarket that wasn't in some way informed by their B2B business is approximately zero in the United States. They said, look, there's, an, there's a Pandora for music where digitally we'll learn and be able to predict what music you'll like. We can build the Pandora of food. It's called Flavor Print. It's phenomenal. As you interact with Flavor Print, it learns more about your profile of flavors that you like and can recommend food and recipes. Nike Fuel, as they describe it, a single universal way to measure physical movement. They're putting a measurement layer on top of all of our physical activities that can help you get better. And by the way, tell Nike what you're trying to achieve and how much you're running and so on. Ticketmaster describes their APIs as the operating system for live entertainment. They describe it today as a billion dollar business and it's growing. And then of course, GE's Predix platform intended to do exactly what John Deere is doing, but at a grand scale with jet engines and so forth, they call the platform for the industrial internet, putting a digital layer on physical goods. And the secret sauce, as Chet described, is network effects. So every single interaction makes you smarter, makes your product and service more valuable. That can be with data. Netflix learns what movies I like and recommends more. BBC learns what movies I like and recommends more. Vivanda, or Flavor Print, I should say, learns what flavors I like and gets smarter and smarter and stickier and stickier for me. It can be about interaction, so Nike, Fuel enables you to compare your performance to other people like you. 
to do challenges to engage in social interactions like Facebook. Or transactions, a marketplace. So Philips U, the light bulb, smart light bulbs, there's an app marketplace. It's a light bulb with an app marketplace where you're matching users and developers. Very powerful. Use creating value for network effects means while all your employees, your marketers, your developers, R&D are home in their jammies asleep, users are creating value every single moment of every single day. Very hard to compete with that with a traditional business model. Core competency of digital disruptors. Second is tools. So very simply, it's funny, why are we here talking about the transformative power of APIs and technology on the heels of IT Doesn't Matter, celebrated article from 2003? Well, here's what he got exactly right. It wasn't that all IT doesn't matter, it's that some IT doesn't matter. More and more we'll be getting cloud-based services that just work like dial tone. I said that in 2003. Now I'm a resident of Washington State. So this is a little bit of comic relief, but it's also a little tragic comic. This is the state-of-the-art physical data center Washington State was building in 2011 that some folks said, you know, I think it's too big. I don't think we need all this space. By 2014, it was built. And the question is, why is this thing empty? After two years, this absolute state-of-the-art physical data center. Here's the fallback plan. Since no one needs a physical data center because they're getting their compute power from Google and Amazon and Microsoft and others, the use of physical paper by governments may be a way to get some value out of this secure physical facility, right? Cloud first is a critical competency. The way to get your compute resources has moved from racks to cloud, and no disrespect to IT as we've known it, right? People got really good at setting up compute resources, but the fastest IT team in the world is now basically comp competing with transporter technology, right? In the time that it takes to say, beam me up, Scotty, a developer hooked into any one of the big platforms can get incredible resources. So cloud, increasingly, folks are getting their compute resources, their data storage and analytics on demand in ways that can scale from zero to effectively infinite instantly. And what's really important, if you think back about that first image of the external ecosystem, that marketplace, you can get intelligence too. So you're probably not going to write your own natural language processing algorithms. But you can get it from Google. You can get it from Microsoft on demand. You're probably not going to create your own Watson inside your organization. But IBM's trying really damn hard to build a business with Watson by enabling you to tap Watson's capabilities on demand. So core competency, embracing cloud, the fact that it enables, enables scope and scale on demand. You can't compete with folks who are doing that if you're trying to do things the old way. Finally, know-how. In some respects, I think this is the most difficult thing for organizations to deal with. And it's also an indication of why, if you've been to some of our previous events, we don't have separate tracks for technology and business strategy. Everyone in the organization needs to know all of this, needs to have context and perspective about how the organization changes and different roles work together, both formally and culturally. So by 1975, we knew that writing software was really, really hard. Fred Brooks came up with his perspective on what he called the mythical man month by working on IBM's OS 360 in the 60s. And his insight was that complex programming projects can't be broken down into tasks without creating communication challenges. And so if you threw, work, threw new developers at a software project that was behind schedule, it actually made it further behind schedule. Or as Michael Cusimano, professor at um, Harvard Business School uh, articulated it, masses of asses writing software doesn't work. We've struggled with this for 30 years. This is the bad side of network effects, right? The communication paths between one programmer and another, easy. By the time you get to 10, it's dozens, it's exponential. So how have we tried to deal with that for 30 years? We'll put some process on it. We'll create the software development life cycle. 
We'll do waterfall planning. We'll spend a lot of time on design and analysis. We'll separate out trying to build it and trying to test it. A lot of hard work went into the software development life cycle as we've known it. But at the end of the day, couldn't overcome Brooke's law. Lots of code in the enterprise is spaghetti. Lots of our systems in the enterprise are essentially spaghetti where you have to figure out how things are interconnected and how to add or change without causing a cascade reaction that breaks other stuff. What's different today? This is Amazon's internal microservices architecture, circa 2008. They shared this at our last conference. They do 50 million microservice deployments a year. And I don't know about you, but my Amazon experience is usually pretty reliable. In 2002, Jeff Bezos issued this edict. All data and functionality through service interfaces, also known as APIs, everything built to be externalizable. This is the same year that Gartner published their note describing how enterprises should create an integration center of excellence to try and get the arms around the spaghetti in the enterprise. It would be an advisory group. And they said the challenge with the advisory group is no matter how smart they are, people might just ignore them and work around them. Jeff Bezos solved this problem if you see the last line of his email. It's not just for Amazon anymore. So this is John Donovan, the EVP at AT&T in 2012. His mission, his mantra was you put APIs everywhere. It's how the IT shop works. It's how your third parties do development for you. It's how things land into your, your environment, right? The lesson that we have learned is from the web, right? Make your digital assets work like the web and you overcome the problem that's been plaguing us for 30 years and more, right? So you probably heard the phrase two pizza teams. That means if any service is too big for you to feed the teams working on it with two pizzas, you need to decompose further, right? Get down to the point where you don't have that communication spiraling out of control by decomposing the service down to a smaller, smaller unit. Make them black boxes to each other, right? The web runs on HTTPS. That ecosystem of thousands of APIs being mashed up tens of thousands of times works without some kind of central hierarchical command because it runs on standards. The API defines how you can get the valuable payload in a very simple, consistent way, and that's all you need to know. And beyond standards, think about promises. We use the phrase that an API is a promise. So yeah, we've all been thinking about standards and trying to standardize in the enterprise for decades, and yeah, 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 we do standards, blah, 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 blah. Think about Legos. People have Lego collections that run into the seven figures. Have you ever been disappointed by a Lego? Yeah, it was a standard. This is from the patent filing in 1958. But in decades, no one's been disappointed by a Lego. They've kept an incredible fidelity to every Lego working with every other Lego. And not because there's like an army of Lego inspectors inspecting every one of the billions of Legos that goes out of the door at Lego. It's because it's ingrained in their culture that what they're doing is delivering on a promise. So web API know-how, make them small, treat them as a promise where what your job is as a technologist or as a product manager is to make a promise to the market that here's the valuable payload you're gonna get in exchange for what you're gonna deliver back to us and keep it and build for the world. I've been asked very often about the whole premise of Jeff Bezos saying, design everything for being externalizable. And on the one hand, you could debate, like, what, you know, let's measure option value versus the incremental cost and blah, blah. On the other hand, you can say, like, you know what? Do you hire developers like John Donovan, who hires thousands of developers every year? You know what you're doing when a developer sits down at his or her desk for the first day? You're trying to get an external developer up and productive as fast as possible, right? Just makes sense in today's digital world. So the web has taught us how to overcome some significant challenges. So these things all work together. I think as you can imagine, in your organization, they work together, but they pose some challenges. Because use creating value is a new way for marketing to think. 
It's a new way for business development to think. Sustainable ability, agility at pace, making your digital assets and your infrastructure work like the web is a new way for IT to work, a new way for IT to think. And of course, getting to the point of embracing what can we get from the cloud rather than building ourselves is a big shift to make as well. It's all how APIs are changing our jobs, but as we heard this morning, it's about the people. It's about each of these roles. The board of directors looks at the world, looks at that outside ecosystem one way or another, however they're getting data about digital and, and revenue and challenges um, presented to them, and says, we need profit, we need to grow. The CEO says, move faster, figure out how we adapt and grow. And so all of the executives, but particularly the CIO and CMO, need to innovate to figure out what can we do that's new and differentiated. The line of business needs to deliver experiences that delight customers. You know, this is why it's time to adapt or die, because it's about everybody's job and how all these jobs interact every single day. You have to change the mindset, learn the tools, make the most of the resources available. That's how we hope you approach the rest of the day, where we have sessions talking about how you speak digital with the C-suite, what API best practices are, how you change culture, what cloud should mean to your organization. It's technology, it's strategy woven together. Because for all of us, that's what our jobs need to look like. So we have time for questions. We will take them from the floor. And I will also check to see if we've gotten any live questions. Except that there's a passcode on the iPad. So <laughs> if you texted a question, please stand up and ask the question. <laughs> Uh, here's a mic right behind you. Here you go. You mentioned the needs for enterprise to build their API to uh, digitize their assets. Mm -hmm. Do you see a value proposition for independent software workshop to build a mesh up API? Yeah, absolutely. So one reason why these gears are so powerful is because they work together, right? So the more APIs that are being built to be externalizable, the more people in the enterprise you have thinking about, what could we do with these? How could we share them outward? The more there's a marketplace of APIs in the world, the more opportunity there is for small players to join the marketplace. Because you've got more people looking at the marketplace, trying to figure out how could we combine things and mash them up together. So it's a one-way street, right? It's almost like an arms race. There's no incentive and no way someone can think about like, how do we close up? How do we not share anything, right? The opportunity for sharing keeps going up and up because there are more people, large and small, participating in that API marketplace. So absolutely, there's, and in fact, if you look at AI, the interesting thing is, yeah, there's the giants, there's the Watsons, there's Google's natural language processing. They're gonna be very powerful platforms. How can specialists who do one thing really, really well plug into that ecosystem where you've got GE collecting billions of data points on jet engines, some big, super duper cognitive AI being applied to that, and you know, maybe a startup that comes out of a university that says, you know, we don't do much, but we know how to optimize the hell out of a certain type of jet engine. All you gotta do is have that API to be able to mash up as opposed to hire 10,000 people and try to build a whole, whole traditional business. Time for one more, if there are any questions. Please grab me during the day if there's any questions, comments, feedback. We hope you leave today not just learning a few tips and tricks and feeling like you got some useful information, but hopefully inspired about adapting and much more confident that you, your organizations, your colleagues aren't on the dying path. Thanks for your attention, and again, I'll see you around today. All alone as you look through the door, 
nothing left to see if it hurts and you can't take no more lay it all on me no you don't have to keep it under lock and key cause i will never let you down and if you can't escape all your uncertainty baby i can show you 